Okay, welcome everybody to uh, a lecture. My name is uh, Jen Bandel. I'm a professor of sustainability leadership at the University of Cumbria, where we would have been uh, joined, meeting each other today for those of us who could get to the beautiful Lake District, um, but we're doing it on, uh, on video instead. I'm just going to do a share screen to um, start the lecture. Uh, so now, um, this should be coming up. There we are. So the title of my lecture today is Universities Facing Climate Chaos, Approaching Deep Adaptation. And uh, this is the first time that I have sought to make a connection between the new work I've been doing over the last couple of years on what's called now deep adaptation um, with my work as an academic. And so this lecture, uh, when I came to think about it, it it's, it's really, I'm, I'm mainly intending to speak to people in academia, either as um, lecturers themselves or as um, scholars who are interested in academia, uh, current students, funders, regulators, basically anyone who's interested in, in some way in uh, higher education institutions. And I have given quite a few talks over the years and also quite a few uh, Q&As and sessions um, uh, on this topic of deep adaptation. And in preparing for this, I realized I'm nervous. And I realized it's because I'm actually trying to bring this agenda to universities, to academia. And I think it's quite funny. I, when, when people come as students on my courses, we talk about how many of us, because most of the students I teach are um, so-called mature students, you know, uh, uh, my age, for example, and we talk about some of the ideas that we have, the assumptions we have about academia and universities and learning. And I realized I have some of those hang-ups as well about how things should be done. And the material we're about to talk about in this next hour is really, really tough, really troubling. Um, it's huge, it touches on everything. Um, and so how do you begin to approach that in a way which sort of seems somehow educational and, uh, and such like? So it was, a, it was quite a daunting thing for me. So thank you for joining, 60 participants, it's wonderful. I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Um, and I would really enjoy feedback as well on uh, how does one even go about talking about this, this topic um, uh, in a university context? I mean, I have done it in, in, in lectures, small lectures, um, but not as an open lecture like this. I have worked on environment um, since well, forever, really. I mean, my first job after university in 1995 was with WWF, but I think even since 1987, I was an environmentalist and very interested in what was happening with the world's environment and even then with climate change. 1987 was when the uh, UN adopted the Brundtland Report, which said that climate change is happening, we're causing it, and it's dangerous. 1987. And I realized that when I talk about climate change um, and the climate emergency, that is quite new to a lot of people, and therefore perhaps some people don't realize how. We have for decades, those of us who've been aware of this, been trying to push for significant change. And efforts have included lobbying governments, businesses, banks, as well as adv advocating to the general public, uh, and also trying to create alternatives. However, as this graph shows, this graph is from um, Dr. Wolfgang Knorr, who's uh, a deep adaptation advocate. Um, but importantly, 25 years as a climatologist um, with quite senior roles in that field. He shows here a history of efforts uh, to try and do something to curb carbon emissions. Uh, and he shows how emissions have pretty steadily grown up, one, grown 1.65% 1 on average a year over that time. So basically to show that we've been trying and things have not been changing. And just recognizing that 
and knowing that there is a 40 year time lag for the full heating effect of all those carbon emissions over that time um, means there's a lot of there's a lot of global heating and also related volatility in our weather to come no matter what we do to try and cut and draw down carbon and for me I have been working or had been working for decades with the assumption that we could still do something to prevent climate change. Um, and I, I, was, um, I was worried as more and more news came across my screens about how bad climate change is. Um, and therefore, I decided I needed to take time away from university I uh, took a year's unpaid leave to actually look into it. And what I found was that actually the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was um, understating the uh, existential risk, meaning the risk to our society and even our species from climate change. And that's because they needed to find consensus. Uh, and where, there couldn't be, where it couldn't be found, they would leave out a whole range of important information. So this, I, if you're interested in that, this paper was uh, What Lies Beneath is important to look at. Now these aren't sort of radical outliers. The foreword is written by a major figure in the history of the IPCC, um, Hans Joachim Schellnhuber. Um, and so it's important to realize that, that here, that story we heard say in October, 2018, that we still had in 12 years to uh, prevent the worst of climate change, well, actually, that is, uh, that's, a, that's an extremely conservative and contested view. Um, and we keep now seeing more and more research coming out to show how actually um, there's been this kind of political compromise that's been going on. So this new paper, uh, April 2020, which shows how uh, over decades, uh, the climate science world and climate policy community have have basically reframed the challenge in order to be able to keep people talking and to uh, allow for basically um, uh, failure to meet uh, effective uh, targets for, for mitigation. Now we see therefore that the, the predictions were less than what's actually now occurring. So we can debate about the science, but actually what we're seeing through measurements is really important. For example, this just from last year, 70 years sooner than predicted Arctic permafrost melting. And of course that is very scary because it releases methane into the atmosphere, which is uh, in, uh, an intense carbon, I'm sorry, intense greenhouse gas. And we're also seeing scientists now looking at feedbacks like that and finding that actually many of the, the feedbacks and so-called tipping points um, look like they've been reached. Um, and this again is a, something in, in nature. These are top climate scientists, you know, Timothy Lenton, Johan Rockström and so forth. And what's really interesting is that their views are somehow often watered down when they reach the public. So for example, uh, environmental journalist here concluded when writing about this study that the world may almost maybe almost out of time to prevent what uh, they call existential threat to civilization. Well, they didn't say almost. They said the world may be out of time. And we keep seeing um, scientific uh, views watered down by journalists, activists, consultants, politicians, and such like commentators, because all kinds of reasons. But it is really troubling. It's really scary to think that actually uh, humanity, we may no longer be in control. We can still try to cut carbon and draw down carbon, but the future seems to be uh, out of our hands and a catastrophe is on the way. Some climatologists decided recently that they needed to be clear about the implications of their findings. Because as scientists, you typically just say what you can and can't say from a particular methodology, from your particular study, so you don't often join the dots and make conclusions about what does that mean for humanity. But this is a letter in The Guardian from 12 uh, senior professional climate scientists. 
on May the 10th, 2020. It is game over for preventing dangerous climate change now that governments are planning the cheapest and quickest return to consumption, which is incompatible with keeping the average global temperature rise below two degrees C, let alone 1.5 degrees C. It is time to acknowledge, they say, our collective failure to respond to climate change, identify its consequences, and accept the massive personal, local, national, and global adaptation that awaits us all. So there's no easy way, there should be no easy way of reading that or for me to read that out to you and it not to be sobering, it not to sort of uh, sort of take your breath, take the, if I, if, I mean, I, I work on this now, and so maybe I become a bit numb to it, but you know, there it is in black and white, professional climatologists saying such a thing and knowing the kind of backlash that can come to them because a lot of their colleagues do not want to hear this message uh, for themselves, for their families, and also for their, their story of self. Um, and so many of them will say that this is somehow irresponsible. However, if you're talking like this, you're not saying that we should stop trying to cut carbon and draw down carbon, that we should try and give humanity as best chance as possible. But what we are saying is that it's time to look at these really unbearable possibilities and actually start to talk about, well, what if it's coming and start to look at how we can adapt? Um, how can we prepare for uh, terrible effects? More scientists are beginning to recognize that is the case and are beginning to talk about the possibilities for global systemic collapse. And they're beginning to point out how traditional academic disciplines and traditional forms of academia have sort of in inhibited um, our ability to join those dots and actually uh, get the message out because you tend to look at things in, in isolation rather than join things together and then say what, is, what might that mean. This is a study from uh, 200 scientists signed on to this from different disciplines uh, saying that we now risk uh, global systemic collapse because of all kinds of uh, factors including uh, abrupt climate change. It is important um, when esteemed universities begin to talk like this. The MIT Technology Review, so American University, MIT, um, last year came out and said, welcome to climate change. Basically, climate change is here. It's not theory. It's not in the future. It's damaging all of our lives in some way right now. And there's quite a lot of anxiety spreading around the world as people wake up to that. And of course, what's our climate anxiety is one thing, and it's tough to live with. Um, and it's really important to look at. But also, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that for other people, it's actually um, leading to starvation right now. So climate change is identified as one of the main factors leading to uh, hunger around the world. And um, we have a billion people undernourished on this planet. And now hundreds of millions in Africa are actually facing starvation this year, um, with one of the key factors being what's happened with climate change. Uh, for example, the, the plagues of locusts as to do with the changing monsoon rains but also the droughts damaging uh, agricultural production in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and so it's important to stay present to what's happening and to look at what we can do. This becomes a humanitarian crisis and, and what, what can we actually do to, to help? And of course, the world has turned away from many of these issues perhaps as, um, as a result of pandemic, but it's been important to notice um, people who've been making the connections. So the UN Environment Program has made it clear that outbreaks of zoonotic diseases like coronavirus are more likely, are made more likely because of uh, habitat removal and habitat degradation and, and uh, disruption to ecosystems. This is not a controversial view. This, is, this has been known for decades and there's lots of science to show that. Um, lesser discussed is how climate change by increasing habitat destruction and degradation and increasing pressures on species such as bats uh, leading to changes in migration patterns and leading to uh, more ill health in those wild populations can therefore um, lead to more uh, likelihood of viral shedding 
and therefore the possibility of more transmission to other species and ultimately to humans. The implication of this is to say is not to say, hey guys, think about climate, but it's to realize that um, because of climate change and environmental degradation, pandemics like our, the current COVID-19 pandemic are now becoming more likely. So some people would see that our current uh, societal restrictions and in some cases breakdowns um, are in some way related to climate and environmental degradation. Now in the university sector we're seeing impacts directly already whether it's flooding libraries or servers or classrooms or overheating of uh, servers or examination halls and such like. Uh, so it's not it's not just again it's not somehow outside of the university's realm of of work now faced with this information if you're an academic you'll be busy working hard um, focused on your students and like me you'll see this news and feel anxiety and i think perhaps like i was feeling in the past some cognitive dissonance this sense that i know this is happening it fundamentally could challenge everything that I do and that we do. Um, but how do I work on it? And I think the cognitive dissonance can mean that the passion for your work and curiosity about your work can be, can be dulled. And we risk feeling somewhat lost in terms of what to do about it. Um, how to show up with passion and commitment with our students. Um, how to respond with creativity when our university uh, faces difficult challenges such as now with the income issues around uh, arising from the pandemic and I think it's reasonable for any of us academics to want to feel motivated that we are going to help young people to get ready for whatever's ahead and that you know we're producing knowledge and communicating knowledge to, that, that matters for them but you know moving into a place where we can have that motivation is not going to it's not just going to be come overnight and it's not going to come from avoiding this sense of anxiety and the, the despair um, I think we it's important to have some time for introspection I think I'm finding in my own work and in my own life that despair has is part of part of the pathway um, it it leads to some humility some introspection and therefore uh, pre prepares the way for for transformation and in the university sector we need to take a good long look at ourselves because universities have had a key role as knowledge producers and promoters yet humanities arrived at this horrific ridiculous situation we face now um, so we could learn how humanity has understood the world and ourselves so badly to drive a mass extinction event and threaten societal collapse we could consider what influence universities and academia may have had in this situation or in not averting it. And we could connect back as we do that with the original purpose of a university and what a university could be. We could look at how universities could in future avoid making matters worse and even try to help reduce harm and increase the chances for future life. Now, of course, this kind of message feels even more difficult within my sector right now um, because of what's happened with the pandemic you know after tourism and and restaurants and certain hotels such like um the university sector around the world is facing great difficulties because of the pandemic um, and the the support for universities has been paltry that announced so far in many countries compared to the amount of money being offered to polluting, large polluting industries, either directly from government or through central banks buying corporate bonds. Um, it's almost like we've, the universities have, um, by allowing the story, the, the neoliberal corporate story of the, the university as somehow, like any other corporation, providing a service to consumers, to allow that story to grow means that at this moment, people aren't looking at the universities necessarily as a, as a public good and a public utility, um, which, is, which is awful because that's what universities could and should be. So there's gonna be, it's tough times. And I think at least at this moment now, while it's an important time to reflect on, on the future of the university. 
I mentioned that. What, where have we got to with universities? Well, we've become bureaucratic businesses, arguably. There's, there's a lot of people who've talked about this. Um, I've, I've, I, I link a, I've listed a few things there and linked to it. But um, the implications for many people in this sector is, um, is a problem with well-being. I mean, uh, academics, teaching students, researching, needing to publish, needing to write grants, doing a lot of work, suddenly having a lot more work to do, a lot more pressures, um, and, and a lot more admin to do. And so a very recent study just out shows that 17 UK universities study the rise, rise in staff access to counseling was 155% up in recent years. And the universities with data for 2009 to 2018, occupational health referrals was up 170%. So um, the, yeah, the university sector for academics, there's the evidence here that there's uh, the increasing stress levels. And also, if you look at um, what's happening for students, um, we're seeing similar issues around, um, you know, now that we've sort of reframed the student as a consumer of education, is that really helping? Um, studies are showing that the original idea of why that would be good is actually backfiring. It's promoting passive learning where people want to just learn in order to get the credential, um, in order to uh, progress in their career. So it's really shifting us away from um, just learning in a sort of a more chaotic, chaotic and generative way where there's debate and challenge. Um, and this isn't me saying this. There's a lot of research to, to, um, to show this. And a big part of this has been the growth of uh, tuition fees being paid by students. So the, first of all, the abolishing of the grant and then the abolishing of funding for tuition fees. And this, what's happened in the UK um, and how that's changed the, well, basically indebted students so that that's now influencing their choice of course and choice of career in ways that favor um, for-profit enterprise rather than necessarily favor society. Um, this was known about studies from years ago about how higher education was working in the States was showing that actually, you know, around half of graduates were saying their career choices were being influenced by anticipation of loan payments. Um, so, the, yeah, we, we, we're, the universities are not in uh, a great shape in terms of the culture uh, of, of the institution or the sector. Um, and so I think it is a moment, it's a good moment, this moment of pandemic and as we face climate crisis to begin to re everything, think everything. Because we are going to see debates in different countries around the world about why should the university even survive. Um, and which I think it will be good to have those debates. Um, and the reason I think it is good is because I have been wondering about what is the role of the university as we face climate chaos. You know, if the dominant story towards expansion, profit, ranking, status, and such like continues in the face of possible societal collapse, then why are we bothering to try and adapt the university to keep all that going? You know, our sector has a lot of rethinking and reimagining to do. I wonder, could universities become venues for generating and exchanging ideas and experiences that help us all learn to live more kindly, wisely, and creatively in the face of greater turbulence. That would have implications for university strategy, the nature of research, the nature of teaching and outreach. So this is what I want to talk about uh, today in the second half of the lecture. But um, first of all, I just want to mention what adaptation is about in the mainstream before then looking at deep adaptation and how it matters to universities and what universities could do for it. So I think one of the best definitions I've seen of mainstream climate change adaptation comes from the EU. Uh, I'll read this out here. Um, adaptation means anticipating the adverse effects of climate change and taking appropriate action to prevent or minimize the damage they can cause or taking advantage of opportunities that may arise. It's been shown that well-planned early adaptation action saves money, and lives later. Examples of adaptation measures include using scarce water resources more efficiently, adapting building codes to future climate conditions and extreme weather events, building flood defenses and raising the level of dikes, developing drought tolerant crops, choosing tree species and forestry practices less vulnerable to storms and fires, and setting aside land corridors to help species migrate. 
So even within just the mainstream climate change adaptation field, there is huge work to be done. And universities could play uh, a role in that. So I want to say a little bit now about um, deep adaptation and, uh, and then how it applies to universities. The premise of the deep adaptation approach um, is that it's time to accept that societal collapse is likely inevitable or unfolding in most perhaps all societies around the world in order for us to attempt to reduce harm and save what we can while finding meaning and joy in that process. Therefore, unlike mainstream climate change adaptation efforts, it doesn't focus on preserving our current way of life, industrial consumer society. Now it's becoming a worldwide movement um, it's, which is promoting peaceful and creative responses to the situation rather than sort of the, the defensive prepping and bunker building that you may have uh, heard about when people have talked about the doom coming. And when I say worldwide movement, I mean there's 15,000 people participating actively and over 100 volunteers in the Deep Adaptation Forum, um, which we set up about a year ago. Now rather than focusing on direct weather related impacts, this agenda invites consideration of all, uh, all aspects of societal disruption and therefore the psychological and indeed spiritual implications of anticipating or experiencing collapses in societies. Now this is huge and scary and um, so deep adaptation is not providing simple answers but providing a framework for people to explore everything previously assumed about personal and collective progress so that we might find new agendas for personal and collective action. It's certainly not about stopping attention to mitigation and carbon cuts and drawdown, but it's about opening up to a wider agenda. And what we're seeing over the last year is that it is providing a space for people to reconsider some of the deepest concepts and habits, such as othering of nature and people, or the primacy of individualism, consumption, growth, or status seeking, or the sense that somehow humans have dominion and control over nature. Indeed, it's also inviting people to look at the suppression of our awareness of death and our fixation on technological progress that results. Or our common mutual suppression of difficult emotions uh, in our relating, especially in the public sphere, as we seem to think that we need to show up somehow positive and confident rather than revealing what's really going on for us as we look face life as, as it seems now. So for a university to embrace deep adaptation means a fundamental reconsideration of some of the deepest assumptions of what is knowledge and what is progress. So big, and which is I think why um, um, I felt kind of a little bit of nervousness about actually approaching this lecture to try to join deep adaptations and, and university. Um, what I want to do now though is um, say a few things just about how universities are responding to climate. Um, and research has been done to see how universities are responding to climate. And it appears that those universities engaged on climate around the world where there is research on this are not working on climate change adaptation in terms of they're not looking to adapt their own uh, activities. Now in the UK in the last year or so, we've had 24 universities declare an, a climate emergency. And I went and looked at the uh, websites um, that actually list that. So that's um, uh, the Climate Emergency website and EAUC, which is an organization promoting sustainability in higher education in the UK. And it seems that um, only one uh, university actually includes adaptation in its uh, climate emergency agenda, and, that, and that's Plymouth University in the West of England. Um, the EAUC itself recognizes this gap and in 2019 began offering introductory courses, webinars uh, and such like for universities. And if you're interested in this, um, I do recommend you go to their website to help, which is sustainabilityexchange.ac.uk forward slash adaptation. And from there you can download um, a few guides and also you can find uh, webinars and such like. And that's, the, um, that's for how universities can start on a on a mainstream adaptation agenda and put, a, uh, put an adaptation team together. We, um, 
and things could be you know, things that are being done by those few universities around the world that have looked at this is like burying po uh, power lines to avoid the, the threat of storm damage or purchasing emergency generators or starting new projects for energy and water conservation or um, preparing for flooding um, you know like landscape management updating flood maps um, but also developing emergency preparedness plans you know um, how to manage volunteers, how to get basic needs met, um, how to protect key facilities, how to provide um, refuge for local community in a storm or in intense heat and such like. Um, I'll link to some of that in the, the notes when I, um, when I put this video up online. But there's, there's a limit here, um, limits of mainstream. Um, and. Uh, And that's because we need to really think beyond what we can manage um, at, at a local level. Um, a limitation of mainstream climate adaptation work in organizations is that the focus is on weather changes such as flooding or intense heat and not on the broader societal disruptions that are coming from indirect impacts of climate chaos. They can include impacts on food prices and availability with implications for well-being, attitudes, crime, or impacts on the outbreak of disease or the psychological problems associated with climate anxiety. So people already working at climate, on climate change adaptation at an organizational level, not just in, in universities, uh, do report that they're often siloed. Um, so they're only able to work on minor changes like adjustments to buildings, for example, rather than bigger strategic questions. And they're also learning that many of the risks and hazards to normal operations whether from climate or the pandemic, or civil unrest and so on, can't be managed at the organizational level. Um, yeah, and we, when we consider potentially catastrophic risks, then foregrounding the organization rather than um, people, us and our families and the wider community, doesn't seem to really sit right, uh, practically or, or morally. And um, so they're also realizing that perhaps the typical team for adaptation, which will be people from um, risk management, business continuity, estates management and such like, uh, isn't, isn't, isn't uh, the right composition or sufficient composition to, to address this much broader uh, agenda. Now, I've worried when I was thinking about presenting this, I'm now about to go into deep adaptation, but I worry that um, this all feels a bit stressful it is for me so I wanted to give you a little interlude just before we move to the next bit and so um, despite all this horrible stuff happening um, there's lots of uh, things to love in the world this is a uh, Otis we've just fostered some some kittens and uh, it's a reminder to just live in the present and have have fun so this is Otis say hello to Otis um, I thought I'd make a cat video. I've never made a cat video before, kitten video even. So um, um, there's more to come. So I'm going to go back to the screen share and uh, tell you a little bit about deep adaptation. So the deep adaptation framework is four questions. Uh, the first, uh, and it's uh, intentionally not about what do we invent to go forward, but actually, well, um, sort of a post-progress paradigm of creativity and dialogue. The first question is, what is, we most want to, what is it that we most value and want to keep? Um, kittens, obviously, but apart from that, uh, love, um, truth, learning, and such like. Um, relinquishment, what can we let go of not to make matters worse? Um, what can we bring back to help? So, you know, in the, in the, the modern societies, there's so much that we've, 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 we've lost. Uh, and actually, many of us are reconnecting with some of those things during lockdown. And the fourth question, with what and whom can I make peace with in the face of uh, our mutual mortality? And that's basically the idea that when you're looking at this really squarely, unflinchingly, realize that we can try, we can do lots of amazing things. Amazing things will happen, but it doesn't seem like humanity's in control uh, if we ever were, probably we never were, uh, that's a delusion. But um, therefore, when you, part of this agenda is that felt sense of mortality and impermanence. And, so with that in mind, yeah, how do we make peace with that? And what does that invite us to, to think about? Um, do you want a, 
Um, let me just check. Am I, I want to just check whether screen sharing is happening. It's not, is it? Let me just do this now, do screen sharing. I'll just show you those. Um, this is, here we go, I'll just show you those there. Resilience, relinquishment, restoration and reconciliation. So these are um, the four R's as we call them and they prove to be quite useful as a, as a structure for dialogue. So um, do you want another kitten? Should we have another kitten? I realize this, yeah, why not? So um, the deep adaptation strategy team, this is what I'm suggesting. I thought, how on earth do you actually start to work on this in, in an organization? Um, and it's very, very early to, uh, this, is, this is Amy, by the way, Otis and Amy, you might be, uh, hello, I was wondering, did I, did I hold Otis up high enough? This is Amy, hello Amy, yes, um, there you go. Um, it's very early days for me in looking at how to um, work on deep adaptation in an organization. And I was thinking, so what could a DA team in a university uh, look like and work on because um, there isn't one yet this is all very new and I thought well they'd have to look at everything about the university and therefore needs to involve people additional to the normal adaptation specialisms of risk management continuity management or estates management so a DA project team at university would helpfully include a psychologist a well-being officer from human resources community engagement or public affairs officer representative from a trade union or if none then a staff council and of course the student union and I think someone from long-term strategic planning would be important to be there. Uh, and I think you also need really good facilitation to help people engage outside, outside of their silos. So a trained facilitator would also be important. And I think that means you, you need that not, not to be chaired by, say, a senior manager or a project manager. Um, because this is a massive and emotionally challenging agenda um and challenges a lot of how we've come to understand our roles at work and of course the risks here are so great that um it's really important to look at how to influence societal processes more generally so it implies a reassessment of research education and outreach as much as operations so i'm going to make some suggestions now for 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 each um, Let me just stop the screen share. So what I'm suggesting is um, universities need to do all the mainstream adaptation stuff that universities are not doing yet. Um, to limit a climate emergency to mitigation alone when you know that your staff and students are going to be in a climate disturbed future um, is just not coherent. So all the normal stuff, making buildings resilient and capable of providing uh, community refuge from dangerous heat, cold or precipitation, that's all important to do. Um, but this agenda goes deeper than that. I would say stop growing. It's time to drop the idea of more students and income being the goal. So don't build any more buildings, improve what you have. And secondly, start growing. Invite communities to work with you to cultivate land if suitable and support local autonomous trading networks and local currencies to try and promote resilience locally for if and when national and international supply chains and systems be, begin to break down. So I'm going to mention a few things about implications for research and then I'm going to mention a few things implications for education and then I'll summarize with eight steps for adapt academia on deep adaptation and then it's uh, over over to yourselves um, for q a so thanks for bearing with me and um i have one more kitten um, which i'll, I'll, I'll uh, uh, grab her in a moment uh first thing to say about research is climate will increasingly impact our ability to do research um indirect in effects that will stay destabilize funding for it as well so just at that level, it's, you know, it's, you can't get away from this. Climate chaos is going to affect everything, including even just the ordinary conduct of research. 
But I think each academic discipline could engage in new research projects related to adaptation and deep adaptation. The potential collapse of society affects everything from psychology to engineering to economics to sociology and so on. The topics within each discipline are endless. Some disciplines could team up with others for problem-based applied research on issues like adapting local town. But that isn't enough. As I was saying earlier, there's, there's looking at possibilities or likelihood or inevitability of societal collapse raises serious questions about how humanity operates and what we think we know. So introspection on the role of mainstream approaches to knowledge and the subject disciplines is really invited once you anticipate societal collapse. For instance, why has climate science been so limited in its ability to garner attention? Why have economics and management studies been hastening the damage of our societies on the environment? Now, there's already scholarship on how disciplines become communities that serve themselves and not the public, how they restrict wider understanding and do not support their experts to be adept at synthesizing insights from across disciplines. Anthropologists have published on this for decades now, but it means that expert advice tends to be very partial, reliant on one epistemology or theory of knowing, and therefore provide, prioritizes one set of information over another because it appeals to their existing preferences, their existing epistemological worldview. For instance, in some countries right now, the medical advisors are priv privileged computer modeling over other information and approaches, thereby, thereby downplaying how any model is a simplification based on the designer's choices on what variables and relationships to include and how to weight them in ways that are subjective, socially influenced model suiting and ultimately fallible. Now the same problem applies to climate models. So there's an unhelpful sense of confidence in academia, which reflects an unhelpful sense of confidence in humanity's cleverness itself. And it's expressed by over-reliance on modeling amongst many other approaches. Now the implication may be that humanity could benefit from more academics embracing approaches that describe uh, by researchers as transdisciplinary or postdisciplinary, or also this field called post-normal science. All of these approaches arise from the truth that any subject division, any disciplinary division, is an arbitrary and limited tool for our understanding and our ability to make sense of the world can be helped by understanding those limits and seeking to transcend them through more plural approaches. Now, one approach that's relevant for all of this is what's called critical subjectivity. So, ditching this idea that there's such a thing as objectivity which can be reached and um, is somehow uh, a, a way of saying that we have validity for our knowledge, knowledge claims but actually to develop one greater awareness of our own subjectivities and how that's influenced by society and by the financial interests that work in a particular field of knowledge now to avoid the limitations of our disciplines on our utility as scholars at this moment in time, I think we could be supported by universities to move across disciplines and subjects as society changes and our interests evolve. Now that can't be supported in a system that requires publications in academic journals that are difficult to be published in unless you give your, all your research time fully to one discipline and prioritize its theoretical preoccupations over your engagement with life as you're finding it now. So I think universities, to support their staff, to become relevant at this moment, will need to rebel against the mainstream ideas of what is quality research. Now I'd like to move on to possible implications for education, but probably after that little bit of polemic, you might want another kitten. So this kitten is uh, just being named, and we name her Nina. Nina is the smallest of the bunch. Hello, Nina. Hello. Hello. Yes. Needs to eat a bit more. Anyway. So hello to the world. All right. Back to there. Oh, a beating heart. Wow. Ow. And spiky. Ow. Okay. Um, so uh, if you want to see one of them again, say it's Otis, Amy, and Nina. I don't have any more for today. Um, although we like them, so maybe we might foster more. Um, there are lots of kittens that need fostering at the moment. Um, first, for education, um, I think it's important as academics that we realize where young people are, are at. 
In 2019, in the UK, a third of 18 to 34 year olds reported that they were very or extremely worried about climate change. So this situation is only going to increase over the coming years and will affect choices about whether to even go to university and then which courses to take. And it will also affect their emotional well-being while they're with us at university. Um, and if they're showing up in courses where this can't be looked at and they're having to cram for, for, for exams uh, and work so hard and it just seems so separate from the news that they're hearing and the impacts they're seeing around them, then that, that cognitive distance isn't good for them, isn't good for us. Uh, the other issue for education is we can consider how universities have been influencing society in ways that haven't stopped this climate tragedy and perhaps have made it worse. You know, there are incredible thinkers over the years like Krishnamurti or Paolo Freire um, that have really been ignored by the mainstream of university education. Paolo Freire, for example, said that education is an exercise in either liberation or domestication. And increasingly, we see that students, our students, need a credential for their career to pay down their student debt. And while tutors, we fear a bad evaluation. So the learner and the tutor are increasingly relating together within this framework of subconscious fear, so routinized that we hardly perceive it or sense that it might be a problem. In fact, we even esteem it somehow. Now that context is not about the love of inquiry or the gentle holding of our mutual confusion and despair, which is actually where unlearning can happen and transformation can happen. So I think we can take steps to shift this situation in more of our courses. Now tutors are expected to know, aren't we, what we're talking about. And yet we're in an unprecedented situation where we can drop everything we thought we knew and we taught about um, to try and work out how do we face this terrifying future? How do we try to adapt? I mean, in my case, I know that much of what I have learned over the last decades, what I've become an expert in, um, isn't much use going forward. So why do I try and pretend that it is um, in order to make my life easy and continue to sort of publish and teach? Or do I admit that and say, actually, um, I need to learn too. And I think I'm not unusual in that situation. And so I think it would be good to begin to reimagine the role of tutors like me as not the sage on stage and not know it all, um, not at the person who can tell you whether you've got the answer right or wrong, but basically as a companion in a journey of learning and unlearning where we'll learn as much from talking uh, to people um, who show up in our classes as we can tell them or learn or help them learn. Um, other implications for education. We could work on adjusting learning outcomes, content and activities for any level of student in any course to include more attention to their personal development in the face of societal disruption, including non-intellectual, non-thinky forms of learning and unlearning, where grading just, it doesn't matter, shouldn't be in there. Um, we could enable the creation of such modules on personal development that can be shared between all programs at universities, no matter what you're studying, from medicine to sociology to history to economics to nursing, whatever. And we could enable the launching or promoting of courses that address climate adaptation and societal resilience. And we could promote existing courses or create new ones that are relevant to deep adaptation, such as agroecology, permaculture, psychology, critical social theory, personal development, uh, dialogue and facilitation processes. So um, I'm going to sum up now. I know you've been listening for quite a long time. Um, I had quite a lot to say on this topic once I decided to uh, actually work on it. So um, I'm going to share my screen again if I'm not doing it already. Here we go, share screen and this is the summary. Um, uh, there we go. So I've come up with eight steps for academia on deep adaptation. Um, and if you're interested by wondering how, how, how long we go on to, I, I do want to have Q&A. And so I'm, I'm prepared to hang around uh, for half an hour after I finish, I'm about to finish, um, and uh, have question and answers. And of course, there's no lecture theater room uh, here, so you can just leave at any point without sort of looking awkward. 
Um, so eight steps for academia on deep adaptation. Here they are. I'm going to go through them one by one. Uh, each one also has a sort of a question, a conversation starter for, for academics or managers in academia or funders or regulators uh, or people who have an interest in it. So the first one here, facing reality. It's time to recognize that there's credible analysis that it's too late to prevent a catastrophe affecting all of us. And so it's time to ask what if, and consider how that scenario renders previous assumptions about progress, professionalism, success and priorities, all highly questionable. So basically you could start that with a question, what if near-term disruption is certain and we creatively explore implications? Reframe strategy, step two. It's time to consider that the growth of activity and income is now a redundant frame for organizational strategy in this sector. And so that anyone using that as their strategic framework would now be in error. It's time to invite colleagues to explore authentically restoring a deeper purpose as the real mission of a university rather than a mere motto when actually people know that, oh, well, it's just about the bottom line. So the question, conversation starter, what do we want to be enabling if more societies are going to break down? So again, none of this agenda works unless you allow yourself that first step of really what if this is our situation, this is our future. Third step, because if you're really seeing our situation that way, as I do, and as many thousands of people do now, and perhaps the million, uh, millions of people who are interacting around this idea of societal collapse do, um, then the third step is we'll prioritize people. Focus on the overall strategy, safety and well-being of staff, families and communities above the success of the organization. You know, many or even all, all organizations are going to collapse if society collapses. And so how to help each other, you and me, um, to prepare and cope for future disruption is the most important thing. So one approach is to encourage and enable staff to reduce their hours below full time or take study leaves without any negative effects on their position, influence or progression, so they can spend more time engaged in the community and involving their focus and skills. So the conversation starter for this is, if this organization might not exist in 10 years, how could we help each other now? And I mean that, I don't just mean my university, I mean, if you are Cambridge University and you're looking at what really is happening in the world, you should be asking yourself this question. Just because you're around for 800 years doesn't mean you'll be around for eight more. So, um, fourth, get practical. Invest in adapting the university more to the direct and impact, indirect impacts of climate change as well as its local community. Recognize the importance of workplace climate safety. So climate is beginning to be understood by the global trade union movement as part of occupational health and safety. And therefore there will be legal liabilities coming your way as employers if you don't work on it. Um, create and empower a deep adaptation team which includes members from business continuity risk management sustainability and estates you know the typical organizational adaptation team but also people as i've mentioned before from strategy well-being community engagement public affairs trade unions and student unions and provide this team with good facilitation and also psychotherapeutic support now issues should not only include the direct impacts of climate change such as floods or wind damage and such like but also ways of enabling economic resilience such as diversifying local food and energy supplies so a conversation starter here could be how can we make climate adaptation and deep adaptation organizing principles for our whole organization step five level with students you've got to meet young people where they're at by recognizing that the future is so uncertain the insight into oneself and developing life skills and enjoying life is as important as intellectual achievements towards a career. Incorporate such aims into core modules of all academic programs and be clear that this new era involves educators like us learning alongside students. We are in a new world here and uh, the more that we stick to what we thought we knew and the ways we thought we knew it, uh, the less useful we might be. Encourage general mental health support for everyone that's us and students, and not only those who are seeking it out. So actually normalize the idea that we can be supporting each other and looking for support around our general mental well-being. So in a conversation starter for this, what are the most important conversations young people could be having with us and each other from now on? Six, so this is step six of eight, migrate teaching and research. 
because there's little point in becoming more resilient to near-term climate stresses if the university activities do not help address this predicament or even make it worse. Firstly, incentivize academics to drop those activities, whether teaching or research, which do not explicitly contribute to social and environmental aims and adopt activities which could contribute to those aims. Secondly, consider what it means that the predominant system of subject disciplines, academic institutions, all this has coincided with a tragic unsanity in humanity that has led to mass extinction of life on earth and even threatened now the collapse of civilization. So reject the mainstream rankings and established norms in academia across the board, all subjects, and instead promote transdisciplinarity, post-disciplinarity, post-normal scientific approaches to research, research analysis, and education. Conversation starter for this, you could ask, as we face self-inflicted breakdown of societies, how should we let go of mainstream concepts of best practice and create something quite different? Step seven, last but one, club together. This agenda, this is the problem when I was working on this speech, I thought, is any of this gonna really work? Well, it can't if it's just uh, one or two universities or organizations. Um, and when I say work, I mean reducing harm at scale and giving us a better chance. Um, so yeah, ask relevant unions, trade associations, professional bodies, subject associations and regulators to move to a real, not rhetorical climate emergency footing and explore what that means for everyone in the higher education sector, including issues that maybe a union or a professional association hasn't thought about so far. So the question is, how could groups in our sector support us to engage with this troubling agenda? So the final step for academia on deep adaptation is get political. Encourage your staff and students to find ways to engage locally, nationally and internationally to influence powerful decision-making that affects large numbers of organizations and people with the aim of reducing harm in the face of direct and indirect disruption from climate change. So the question would be to get started on that. As a university, what influence could we have on any local, national or international levers of change? So, thank you. To, just before we go to Q&A, I do want to say something about um, about you as individuals and thank you very much everyone for um, staying with me and I'm very pleased to see lots of chats in the comments and people are connecting and that's wonderful. As you can see this is quite an important topic for me so I had quite a bit to say and I actually cut half of it all out as well. Um, so let me just go back to this. Okay. So the ideas I've outlined here are not likely to happen anywhere in academia, either quickly or at scale. And even if they might, then the disruptions to society may overwhelm our good efforts. And the COVID-19 rescue packages offered to universities are so paltry compared to what's been given to some sectors who've got better PR and lobbying, you know, who, who, you know, who, who know how to get the Bank of England or the European Central Bank to buy their corporate bonds, for example. So I believe that many faculties and even some universities could be downsized, taken over or simply closed. Um, so perhaps you, like many academics, now report, who now report feeling overwhelmed with workload, with less, le less employment security given the pandemic and an anxiety about not integrating awareness of climate chaos into your work. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a difficult moment for academics. So it's no wonder that our mental health is worsening in many countries. Now, I couldn't wait for change, so I decided to go part-time. Now, many people can't do that as quickly or easily as me, but I think if you do choose to downshift your lifestyle, to plan for that, um, to allow, allow yourself to have the chance to go part-time in the future, then you could create time to change your focus and effectively join what's becoming a movement for change, deep adaptation. And perhaps you could return to full-time work if in academia if you manage to integrate what you discover into your academic work. Sorry, I just had a kitten under my toe. Um, you may discover an emotionally challenging but fascinating and enlivening journey of sense-making without the stress of needing to get things right immediately or quickly produce packets of knowledge for consumption either in class or in an academic journal. So I do recommend it. It was essential for me to have taken a year out, which I was I'm able to do unpaid leave and then also to return part-time as I've done uh, to give myself some time and space for sort of thinking and rethinking um, so I do recommend that actually 
Okay, so Q and A. Thanks for hanging in there, everybody. So Matthew, you've, it's over to you to uh, say who's going to ask me a question and um, unmute them. So the first question is from Rosley about communication. Thank you. And Rosalie, could you say where in the world you're from? Hi, Jim. Uh, Professor Jim, thank you very much. I follow your work quite a lot. I've actually also followed you on LinkedIn. I'm from South Africa in Cape Town. I'm currently studying with the RKC through oh, yes. linked with the Cumbria University, just about to complete my master's in leadership and sustainability. Uh, my question is, and also uh, part of Sarah, uh, Dr. Sarah's um, class, it's about sense making. You know, uh, where is our gap? What, where are you finding the gap? Being in, re, I mean, research for more than 30 years now, is it, where are we failing? Where are we falling short? I mean, the evidence is tangible. It's all over. The writing's on the wall. Where are you finding the stumbling block? Why can't we get it right? You know, uh, I know I'm asking you a lot of questions in, in a short space of time. Does it seem like we, have in, we are indifferent to ecological imperatives at the moment? What is actually, you know, how more can we communicate this message to finally get, you know, to get people to start thinking like we are all one person with one thought, thinking one, you know, thing to get this right? Thank you so much. Thank you, Rosalie, and thanks for joining. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in the, in the we, uh, as you say, you know, the, the problems of our sense making, and also then problems of, of, of how uh, knowledge of our predicament, environmental predicament, uh, has not seemed to cut through sufficiently into, say, the business, the private sector, or the government. Um, my sense is that um, we we have had uh, over the last decades um, an economic system, which um, people call it globalization. Some people call it neoliberal economics, um, which really has has set the agenda um, for governments. Uh, but also, it's per pervaded into every corner of our lives, including. Uh, academic pursuits, scholarly pers pursuits, and so we've we've become, as a species, um, perhaps we always were, less interested in understanding reality and more interested in how can we feel okay, how can we have a sense that we belong, how can we feel that we're respected, how can we feel that we're secure, uh, given that it's uh, we've got to succeed in the marketplace. So we've, we've created a culture in so many countries, it seems, particularly in professional cultures, whether it's in business and government um, and in and scholarship, where there's almost like this, this fear, there's this defensiveness. We couldn't, we couldn't show up in our, in our, with our, therefore with our confusion and our worries. Um, so yeah, I, my view is that it's the economic system that has been a fundamental barrier and therefore the climate movement and climate profession in not wanting to sound radical, in not wanting to sound perhaps anti-capitalist and therefore sort of avoiding these deep critiques uh, has not helped wake up humanity. So that, that's my perspective and I'm, I'm going to be producing a, a paper on sort of the economic and monetary adaptation to climate change in, in about, um, about one to two months time where I'll, I'll explore that a bit more. Thank you. Um, next question, please. I'm, I'm going to stay on this call for another 20 minutes, so um, we should be able to take a, a few questions. The next question is from Amanda. Uh, hold on a second. <laughs> Start my video there. Hi, thank you so much for this talk. Um, I I think that the first question I put in there was regarding the interdisciplinary um, issue. So, I mean, interdisciplinary uh, narity has been around for many years now, um, and I've published across many journals, but I'm not quite sure I understand how specifically this ties into deep adaptation. So I was wondering if you could go a little bit more into detail and in what makes that different than what we've had for decades now. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. Where are you, where are you joining us from? Um, I'm in. I'm actually at University of Freiburg in Germany, but um, my PhD work was all at UC uh, UC Santa Cruz. So I'm across yeah. various countries. <laughs> sure. 
So um, when I, uh, interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary work is great if it's like being applied to a, to try and solve a, a, a problem. Um, but what I'm talking about is that the very existence of disciplines are counterproductive. And that's coming at it from a perspective, which is that the reality is undivided. And so uh, in order to navigate that complexity, um, humanity comes up with categories. Uh, the simplest ones are words, but then the big categories are geography or economics or, uh, and, 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 or physics and such like. And so the problem is when we begin to identify those categories, we, we, we associate those categories with reality when they're actually just fallible provisional tools for looking at reality. And what we've seen in anthropologists looking at disciplines show is that every discipline becomes self-referential and wants to maintain its power and, uh, and actually restrict access to that and develops its own languages and such like. So transdisciplinarity, post-disciplinarity, these two ideas are about, that is like the fundamental flaw of disciplines. And therefore we need to help each other learn how to look at a, a discipline that we maybe don't know too much about or look at our own discipline and see what are the limits and what are the benefits of the way that they're seeing the world and the claims that they're making. So you know, climate models, for example, are very helpful, but of course they are reducing complexity uh, so much. They're excluding so many things and deciding what the variables are and what the relationships are in ways which are their choices being made within a paradigm and so that's not reality and yet what we've seen in climate policy is people informing politicians based on these models um, and so in a sense that's taken people away from the precautionary principle where there's potentially so much cat catastrophic existential damage if we get this wrong and instead you had people arguing over models and 1.5, 2 degrees or whatever. So, so um, another answer to your question is, for me and you, if we want to, it's great to hear you've published in different disciplines, but generally um, it's difficult to leave one discipline and go into another. You need to learn what their preoccupations are and you need to publish in a way which meets those preoccupations and contributes to that conversation. Um, and so it's very rare for an academic to move from one discipline to another. And yet our, the world changes, our interests change. Um, and so that should be celebrated. It should be enabled. And at the moment, the systems do not do that. Um, so, yeah, I am, I'd, I'd, I'd love to see building in creating capabilities for academics to uh, talk across disciplines, but also um, connect with forms of knowledge which are non-intellectual as well so other forms of knowing uh, rather than the thinky stuff um, so embodied knowing um, and uh, uh, even more mystical stuff you know um, uh, and uh, insights from being in nature and connecting with alternative non-modern cultures and the way they understand the world I think uh, is also important which is I think in post-disciplinarity they quite like that I've certainly learned so much for my life, not from um, any academic discipline, but from talking with people when I'm in emotional pain or for taking time out in nature or meditating or such like. So recognizing that this is for a form of knowing um, and shouldn't be excluded is important. Anyway, thank you, Matthew, for the question. So the next question uh, is in three parts about the future of university. I'm going to ask Steph to ask her question as the first part. Steph. Hi, Jim. Uh, this is Steph in Gila, New Mexico, Trumpistan. And so uh, our son is home from first year of university because of COVID. I've been amazed that absolutely nothing has changed with his classes or curricula other than going online. Not one word, even though the world that they are 
ostensibly training him to go out and be a part of has changed so much. Uh, what would you say to faculty or administrators of his university on this? What would you say? I want to know what you would say. And what the next say? questioner oh, is sorry, Ruben Matthew. next. Matthew, yeah? and we're still in the middle of a question. Yes, but this is a three-part question, and uh -huh. I'm inviting Ruben to ask the second part. Oh, okay. There's some fancy process. All right, Steph, I'll have to come back to you to find out what you're... Matthew, could you mute yourself? Because when you type, it's quite loud, and, and thanks. Ruben, I think. Over to you. Yes, the, the, my question is, is, do you know of any university in the world that as an institution is taking the line of thought that you've expressed seriously, that they've actually come to a conclusion that as an institution, they don't need a new strategic plan. They actually need a new imagination of what a university would be in the 21st century. Ruben, is there any such that. place in the world? I love that. Thank you for um, summarizing my speech in one, one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> and the third part of the question from Amanda. Having difficulty unmuting Amanda. Amanda. Yeah, I um, just go to the next question. I'm dealing with a kid. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So that's the third part. So the simple question is, um, so yeah, I I have. Um, only really started to look at my sector uh, for how it's uh, officially talking about uh, climate change. Um, when I say, it, so it's only the last month I've really started looking at this. And I, 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 I haven't found a university that's actually uh, real, yeah. I guess, Ruben, what you're asking for is someone at the top of a university saying, whoa, okay, I've made it to the top of university, I'm vice chancellor now, and I realize that there's a level of introspection that people like me should have and our sector should have because we have accompanied humanity on this journey towards self-destruction. You know, we, we are the universities. We're meant to know shit, aren't we? And yet, what's happened? So, I don't I, I mean, great. I look forward to it. I haven't heard anyone. Uh, if anyone's heard a, a vice chancellor or someone senior saying that, then please pop it in the chat box and I'll, I'll have a look. Steph, I want to hear your answer to your own question. Is that okay? Sure. I'm not sure I have a good, I'm not sure I have a good answer for you. I mean, I guess I would at least hope that some of the professors would take time to be in some dialogue with the students about... <laughs> You know, I know the university's offered some kind of counseling, but aside from that, um, to be in, in dialogue with the students, I mean, our son, many of his best friends at the university are from India. And so they can't go home. They're still stranded at this university that shut down and only has a tiny number of people there. Um, he talks with them constantly every day, which I'm, I'm glad he does. But I, I mean, they should be addressing this. These kids can't even go home, even though the fall may not happen because the U.S. won't let them back in if they ever leave. And so they're sort of stranded. And the future they're all training for in computer science, I mean, um, who knows if the economy will ever get back to needing that yeah. many. Yeah. So um, the problem is, is um, I, I, in one of my slides, I showed how um, the administrative function, uh, so the number of people working in uni admin has spiraled while the people, the academics who do the teaching, um, they, you know, they're actually in many cases, the number of staff have been cut and the number of students you have to, to teach um, has increased. And so I, I feel for the typical academic, if you're not in one of the elite institutions, um, I feel for them with the with, yeah how difficult it is um to provide pastoral support for so many students um 
So I, I think it's, uh, I'm sorry to hear it. And um, in contexts like this, I mean, leadership on such a situation can come from anywhere. So, you know, um, maybe get a group of parents together like yourself, Steph, and, and you know, you, you know a lot yourself and you're great on Zoom. And so hold space together for students to talk online together. You know, I think in the end, what we have to do is are, you know, have high expectations, think what will be good, uh, but don't, don't stay in a, a mode of blame because there's so many people who could just be blamed for all manner of things going wrong. And at some point, just, just give it a go, step up, offer yourself. All right, thank you. And next question, Matthew. Next question is from Robert Morris. Uh, hi, hi, Jem. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm not officially um, in higher education, but I'm a, I'm a secondary school teacher and I'm also a member of the, um, the Ning Education uh, Group on Deep Adaptation. Um, I think you may have already implied an answer to this question. Um, so if you have, if you feel you have, please just toss it aside. Um, I would just really like to know if you've had a response or if you're even familiar with the Alastair Jardine letter that was sent to the government mm -hmm. and um, whether or not, because he outlines pretty much a business as usual kind of plan in that post pandemic. And I wonder what your response might be to that. If you're not familiar with that, that's fine. The other part of my question was that you mentioned critical subjectivity um, and uh, in schools, this has been massively marginalized um, my sense is that um, upstream um, it's been marginalized as well and a lot of that's cascading down to schools my specific interest is obviously trying to reinvigorate that and I wondered how you thought we might reinvigorate critical subjectivity in order to um, address um, our adaptation yeah thank you um you're right it has been marginalized i can't believe that people are working in universities as if postmodernism never happened let alone deeper thinking around uh the sort of the the production of our subjectivities through systems of power including capital and patriarchy and such like it's amazing i just and i i think it's because a lot of people in the university sector have joined uh uh, just sort of to get a job um, so there's some of that desire to learn and to be involved in social change which which uh, just isn't 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 there I mean so I, and I think what's happened is as well that that view of why we're in education has become okay because and I think possibly it's something to do with the bureaucratization of the university um, so what, what, to actually, what to actually do to promote critical subjectivity? Um, model it, model it. I think um, talk about where you're coming from. Um, be open to, be open and vulnerable about how you feel when you hear something that doesn't seem to fit with your existing worldview or what you thought you knew. Um, because one of the barriers to curiosity and inquiry and to change is that we want to push away stuff which makes us feel awkward. Uh, we want to get it right. We want to be admired or respected and so we get it wrong. And, and also we don't want you know, awkward or troubling news. So I think model openness and, and, and be, be clear of where your own subjectivity is quite important. Um, next question, Matthew. Next question is Neil Windet. Uh, also, this is the last question that I've got. Okay. Is hello, Neil there? Oh, hello, Neil. Where are you in the world? Uh, it's Neil. I'm from um, University of Cumbria in the Lake District. The um, question I've got is that many universities have departments such as engineering. To a meeting like this, you tend to get people from mainly the social sciences. How do we get through to uh, um, engineering departments and the like, the hard sciences, which do have, a, have the potential, I would say, to have a very positive impact 
on addressing climate change and the like, but often they're academically, uh, socially and politically conservative. How do we actually make a change there where you've not necessarily got people who think the same way as yourself? Yeah, so there's, there's, um, there's a lot. In a sense, there's, um, for the mainstream climate adaptation agenda, not the deep adaptation agenda, but the mainstream normal climate agenda that I, adaptation agenda that I mentioned, uh, that I summarized using the EU quote for that, there's, there's a big opportunity for engineering departments. Um, uh, you know, the, there's, in terms of how, how we respond, how industrial society responds, that, that is something that um, I think all engineering departments could look at. And I think there are increasing numbers of universities that are launching uh, climate change degrees where they're including engineering or climate adaptation degrees. I think the University of Strathclyde might have done that. So, um, so first of all, just point them towards how engineering does have a place in, in, a, in, a, in a world that's adapting to climate change. But there's a bigger question, which is, um, yeah, to encourage criticality, uh, reflect, reflectiveness and reflexivity, curiosity, um, deeper questioning about the systems that we live in, the political systems and such like. Uh, yeah, I, I would repeat what I've said, which is that if a university is for something more than training, um, then what is it for? Well, you know, education is, I mean, I think Chris, Krishnamurti said it decades ago. He said, if, if we're all going to, if, 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 if all we're going to be is trained to be scientists, scholars, engineers, without any attention to heart, without any attention to the, the what is reality and per, or purpose, like why are we here, then we will just create destruction and misery, the destruction and misery. So uh, many other wise thinkers and elders from all kinds of intellectual traditions and spiritual traditions, wisdom traditions, as well as you know, secular wise folk have said the same thing. And so you know, how, if someone's gonna do a university course rather than just a training, then it's also about evolution of character, isn't it? And it's about self-discovery. It's, uh, it's about personal development. So I don't know. I don't know in the university, I, I, I don't know how many engineering courses have those sorts of modules or not, but I think uh, they should have, definitely. Matthew, is there one more question or is that it? Yeah, there's one more really quick, simple question that cropped up in the chat from David Haley. Okay, hi, and thanks for the, uh, the lecture. Um, my basic question is, uh, if we're going to overturn the neoliberal power structures that currently um, threaten the university's life, um, we need to create a viable alternative philosophy um, that needs to be developed and implemented. So how does your deep adaptation address that issue? So, thank you, David. Can you just say where you are? Oh, sorry, um, I'm on Walney Island, uh, south of the, um, the Lakes District. <laughs> Great, super. So, yes, yeah, so what I, I think I've heard is that um, to overthrow neoliberalism, or um, we need to have a viable alternative framework and ideology. Um, so, there are existing alternative perspectives than the, the neoliberalism um, so I don't know if we need to go go looking for one um, there's, there's a you know there, there is a way of understanding education as something other than uh, training people up to be able to uh, succeed in a global market economy um, there is a so I think first of all just to to recognize what a ditch universities and university managers have dug themselves into at this moment by buying into the story of, of universities as somewhat like corporations and students as consumers. Um, so the first thing is, I think it's sufficient to just critique this ideology, to, 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 to name it to begin with. But secondly, so my perspective from deep adaptation 
is, is based on an anticipation of societal collapse. So um, I don't, my response to, because that's my outlook on life, because I think it's probably going to come uh, in most countries in the world within less than 10 years through direct or indirect impacts of climate change. Uh, I, I don't know how we go forward in that context and therefore I'm more focused on a framework for inquiry, for letting go of all the things we thought we knew. So I'm, I'm quite pluralist at the moment about what does that mean? And I think that if we decide to try and, if we start arguing over what is the best ideology and who's right or wrong, then, then I think we're, we're not staying open, fully open and curious about uh, where we're at. So I'm not offering any simple frameworks or solutions. I'm inviting people to inquire together about and, and, and to know, and, and so actually the, the main framework, we, we have methodologies in the Deep Adaptation Forum about how to show up in groups vulnerably, how to uh, witness within ourselves uh, how our emotional responses to different ideas and how we're attached to being right. Um, and uh, so we, we're trying to encourage more vulnerable, fluid uh, interaction and dialogue and so then to see what emerges. Um, because we don't know whether any of it's going to work you know we 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 when the big thing for me from the latest climate science is it looks like we're not in control it looks like the earth is heating itself and no matter what we do to cut or draw down carbon the future is not ours to control and so we can try and do everything but um but we just have to reconcile ourselves with with we may not have any agency anymore so in that context, it's about how we show up curiously, caringly, compassionately. Um, I've, it's, it's, there we go, we've gone over time. I'm, I'm very grateful to the 30 uh, odd who've stayed to write to this end. Um, and I'm gonna read all the group chats um, uh, at the end. And this is gonna go up online in a few days. And if you want to engage more, then either see it on the YouTube channel and share it with people, so Jen Bandle YouTube channel, or um, go to the research group on the uh, Deep Adaptation Forum, so you click through to the name. So I'm gonna, Matthew, can you un unmute everyone and let's all just say goodbye? Or do I have to unmute everyone? <laughs> I haven't, uh, got it. We don't have a unmute all. Oh, okay. I have unmuted. Thank you everyone for coming. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Jen. Bye bye.